Previously, Qin Tian and his group managed to sneak into the temple under the disguise of hot cocoa merchants. A guard stood by outside the kitchen. He suddenly heard coughing from inside. He checked if there was a fire, but Sorum claimed that the firewood suddenly went out. While the guards were helping to solve the crisis, Qin Tian sneaked out of the kitchen. Ragna, who was inside the huge jar, replaced Qin Tian. However, the guards noticed how he got a different height compared to before. Just then, the parrot distracted the guards by flying away, but Soram told them that it would return on its own. Qin Tian was glad that their plan had worked. He sensed the urgency because he only had an hour to move around. Qin Tian soon ran through the hallways while looking at the ring's navigation arrow. Seeing that the light was getting stronger, Qin Tian sensed that he was getting near something. However, there were still other people walking around and Qin Tian hid to take more precautions. Suddenly, he heard people shouting that they could see God. He checked a room and discovered that most of the residents of the temple were enjoying their own time in their rooms. Well, it is thanks to their behavior that Qin Tian can move around undetected. Going left and right, Qin Tian continued following the ring's direction. However, he reached a dead end where the ring was strongly pointing. He wondered if he needed to phase through it. Meanwhile, the guards are fascinated that the parrot really came back on its own. Just then, smoke started coming out of the kitchen again. The guards checked on them again while Qin Tian sneaked back inside. They hid Ragna during the commotion and joined Soram in apologizing to the guards. The guards got mad and warned them not to repeat the same mistake. Qin Tian found nothing when he roamed around outside. He got stressed after seeing the ring point into a wall. Thinking that it was the same as the adventure video games, Qin Tian thought that the arrow might be pointing somewhere behind the wall. However, Qin Tian ran around it, but the ring still pointed in the wall's direction. After calming down, Qin Tian realized that there might really be something on the other side of the wall. He thought of destroying the wall, but the covert operation that they started is the priority for now. They finished the hot cocoa. Qin Tian is sad that he can't confirm if the priest is Mayan. It was a pity that his group was left behind in the kitchen. The guards soon returned and gave them the rewards that the priest had provided. Of course, Qin Tian chose slaves as the reward so they could rescue Sorum's clanmates. Soon after, Qin Tian's group is escorted back to the outside of the temple. He then notices someone being escorted inside. It was the Haystack Warrior. Apparently, the Haystack Warrior won the Holy Ball game. The Haystack Warrior's goal was to meet the priest. It didn't take long for Qin Tian's group to be led to the dungeons where the slaves were being kept. The guards tell Qin Tian to pick two slaves as rewards. He was surprised to hear that they could only get two. It was a blunder that he didn't ask for the number of slaves as a reward in the beginning. Qin Tian wondered if the slaves could be bought. The guard confirmed it and gave a price for each. 200 cocoa beans for a man, 150 for a woman, and 80 for a child. Qin Tian then noticed that a lot of slaves were painted with blue dye. It just means that there will be a lot of slaves to be sacrificed by the priest again. Just then, the parrot started talking about something in another cell. The parrot landed on someone's arm. A group of slaves immediately recognized the bird that their clan had been keeping. Soram called out to Hei Yu and the rest of her clanmates. Hei Yu, the owner of the parrot, was surprised upon seeing Soram. The guard asked if Qin Tian wanted to buy all the slaves in the cell. Qin Tian confirmed as he already realized that they are Soram's clanmates. He also noticed some children that are meant to be used as human sacrifices. He couldn't bear to see meaningless deaths and asked the guard if he could also buy the children. Suddenly, Qin Tian's ring shone, and a light came out of it as it hit the wall. A systematic voice confirms that their identity has been confirmed and access has been allowed. The ground started shaking as the gate opened. Everyone panicked because of the sudden earthquake and the voice they heard, which they called God's voice. Qin Tian wondered if a laboratory was behind the wall. He got anxious because of this sudden development without being prepared at all. The guards started calling Qin Tian an evil god and attacked him. Qin Tian knew that he was being misunderstood now because of the voice he heard moments ago. Qin Tian then fights back in self-defense to knock out the guard. Kata and Ragna also defend themselves against the guards, who are calling them evil. However, the gate failed to open, and the system rebooted. Qin Tian ordered Soram to get out of the cells with her clanmates. Qin Tian was glad that he hid some things in the jar beforehand. He used a smoke bomb and ordered Kata and Ragna to open the other cells. This is a chance for the slaves to escape their fate as human sacrifices. Qin Tian's group and some slaves started running away while the guards were distracted by the smoke. The system's sound continued, announcing the failure of the gate opening. The priest wondered how the sound got turned on because it didn't have any energy in the first place. The haystack warrior wondered if it was God's voice that they were hearing. A guard then comes to report to the priest that evil spirits have appeared. The priest immediately went out to check on the situation and discovered Qin Tian's runaway group. He noticed the strange light on Qin Tian's hand and got anxious that the secret place had already been found. Knowing that the door had resonated with them, the priest wondered if they also got the inheritance. 
The priest immediately ordered the Haystack Warrior to kill Chin Tian's group. Chin Tian's group finally got out of the gates and Bokuma's group noticed them getting surrounded. Nick immediately dashed off to help Chin Tian. Bokuma caught up to her and the two confronted the guards at the outer gates. Bokuma and Nick swiftly dealt with the guards. Meanwhile, Chin Tian is also doing well fending off the soldiers. He suddenly hears the parrot shouting instructions at someone. Hey Yu dodged an attack after listening to the parrot. The parrot told Hei Yu to go for the hit and he was able to punch the soldier. Chin Tian is somehow impressed by how Hei Yu and the parrot fight. Suddenly, Kata warned Chin Tian to check his ride. The haystack warrior appeared out of nowhere to attack but Chin Tian quickly dodged him. Chin Tian then attacks and stabs the haystack warrior with his sword. However, it was ineffective and the haystack warrior moved fine. Kata then joined the fight to fend off the haystack warrior. Chin Tian got flabbergasted and realized that there was no feeling of hitting or stabbing. Seeing more soldiers coming in, Chin Tian realized that they needed to escape as fast as they could. Just then, Nick and Pokuma arrived as reinforcements. Kata kept the haystack warrior busy while the others tried to escape the area. The haystack man noticed the others, and Kata used this chance to attack the haystack warrior. The haystack warrior retracts his arm, and a spear comes out of the haystack. Kata got surprised and dodged. The haystack man used this chance to chase Chin Tian. Kata shouts from the top of his lungs to warn Chin Tian. Chin Tian blocked the haystack warrior's punch, but he felt the heaviness of the attack. Ragna tried to support Chin Tian but Chin Tian told him to escape with the others while he dealt with the haystack warrior. Chin Tian knew that only he could stop the haystack warrior. Meanwhile, a sick Aya woke up because of the noise from outside. She complains to her brother but she discovers that he is missing. She went out to check what was happening outside and noticed soldiers chasing some people. Nick asked where Chin Tian was but Ragna told her that they needed to go first. However, Nick wanted to help Chin Tian. Ragna stopped her and told her to believe in Chin Tian. Meanwhile, Chin Tian and Kata were fighting against the Haystack Warrior. After fighting for a long time, Chin Tian realized that the Haystack Man was using the Haystack to cover his posture. In that way, his enemy would get confused. However, his Haystack Cloak can only confuse stabbing attacks. Chin Tian used his power to surprise the Haystack Warrior with his speed. Chin Tian managed to slash the Haystack Man and blood spurted. The Haystack Man backed off quickly, and Chin Tian was amazed by his nimbleness. The Haystack Man then got serious and brought out a weapon. Chin Tian orders Kata to find a way to disarm the Haystack Warrior. They need to hurry and help the others being chased by the soldiers. Chin Tian and Kata then surround the Haystack Warrior. Chin Tian easily destroyed the stone spear. The Haystack Warrior tried to counter with a punch but Kata was behind him. The three quickly made a distance from each other. They then gritted their teeth for one more clash. However, a familiar voice intervened in the fight shouting at her brother. Everyone was surprised to hear and see Aya who was out of the house after running. Hearing her call the Haystack Man her brother means only one thing. Aya then asks her brother what he is doing and the Haystack Man tries to make up a reason. Aya wonders if Hu Zhao is doing this for her. However, Aya disliked the fact that Hu Zhao was hurting their friends. Chin Tian and Kata now fully realize that the Haystack Warrior was Hu Zhao all along. Chin Tian tells Kata that this is their opportunity to run away. Just then, Hu Zhao menacingly turned toward their direction and dashed past them. Using the stick part of his spear he knocks out a soldier. Hu Zhao finally removes his haystack coat. He cried a river as he felt really bad for hurting his friends. Aya suddenly felt dizzy and fell unconscious. In the temple, the priest hastily ordered everyone to kill Hu Zhao and Chin Tian. He needed them to die. However, Hu Zhao easily overpowered the soldiers by himself. Hu Zhao then tells them that he will help them get out despite being unqualified as their friend. The trio along with Aya continues to run away while fighting the soldiers. They got near the outer gate and threw the soldiers toward the river full of piranhas. More soldiers caught up to them and fired some improvised arrows. Hu Zhao noticed the attack and used his haystack coat to fend off the arrows. The group ran toward the rainforest and immediately got away from the sight of the soldiers. Chin Tian can see that it is only a matter of time before he gets away from the soldiers in the dense forest. Just then he notices the sand eagles chirp. Ragna and Nick had led Soram's clans away from the temple. Soram kept telling Hei Yu and the others how magnanimous Chin Tian is. Nick notices Chin Tian coming with the Kata, Hu Zhao, and Aya. Hu Zhao kneeled to the ground and Chin Tian got worried. He claims that it was his punishment for betraying his friends. He did use his body to defend himself against the multiple soldiers. Aya then calls her brother's attention and reminds him about their promise. Hu Zhao has brought their friends to a safer place. He fulfilled his promise to Aya. Chin Tian notices Aya's visible symptoms and asks the siblings for more symptoms so he can save her. Hu Zhao panics and wonders if they need a sacrifice. Chin Tian tells him to calm down and Hu Zhao does his best to calm down Aya. He then shares how Aya feels cold despite being near a fire. She will also become very hot and her breath will be the same. Those two cases will alternate from time to time. Chin Tian deeply wonders what Aya's real condition is since the symptoms are too common. 
Hu Zhao mentions how Aya must have offended the gods for the mosquitoes to attack her relentlessly before. Qin Tian then confirms one more time that Aya was attacked by mosquitoes. Qin Tian tells Hu Zhao not to believe in the gods' punishment since Aya has malaria instead. Everyone wonders what malaria is, and Qin Tian explains that it is a disease. Hu Zhao then asks if Aya will be cured since it is a disease instead of a curse. Qin Tian then checks his knowledge database on first aid in the wild. He then finds the section that contains information about malaria. Qin Tian also finds a method for treating it. He quickly asks Hu Zhao to help Aya get up. Qin Tian doesn't have anything right so she decided to use acupuncture for now. He then goes to apply pressure to Aya's acupuncture points. Aya suddenly became a bit better. However, what Qin Tian did was only to ease her pain for now. He exclaims that they need a special medicine to treat her. Soon after, Qin Tian found a lot of medicinal materials on the map projected by the ring. He then discovers the cinchona trees that are native to America. Quinine and artemisinin, which are extracted from its bark, are used to treat malaria. The map immediately points out the place where cinchona trees are growing. Since this is an emergency, Qin Tian, Kata, and White Eye will set out soon to find the medicinal materials. He reminds the others to hide and be careful. Ragna wishes them luck and safety. It will take half a day for them to get to their destination. Meanwhile, the priest watches over a map that is also holographic. He claims he is the god of this area. Using the map, he quickly finds Qin Tian and the others. Qin Tian, Kata, and White Eye travel through the dark forest. Despite having a flashlight, they still need to be careful in the dense forest. However, they must hurry to save Aya, who is at risk. Qin Tian finds a shortcut to traverse the nearby river stream. White Eye jumps in first, but he gets electrocuted. Worried, Qin Tian runs to save White Eye. After stepping on the water, Qin Tian also got electrocuted. Kata tries to save him, but Qin Tian warns Kata not to get near the water. Kata uses his spear to get Qin Tian out of the water. They wonder what is in the water. After their electrocution, Qin Tian's flashlight got busted. Kata suggests using torches from now on, but Qin Tian tells him that they will just make a new flashlight. Qin Tian started fiddling with the broken flashlight and put it together in a bamboo. He also uses the calcium carbide that he brought. It took two hours for Qin Tian to create a calcium carbide lamp. They then put down a log as a bridge. They then cross the river, and Qin Tian now realizes that the electrocution was caused by the electric eel, which was mostly distributed in the Amazon River. It's a good thing that they didn't get directly in touch with them. The morning comes, and they finally arrive at their destination. Kata then starts to gather the bark while Qin Tian starts to work on something. Qin Tian prepares his materials and the recipe he got from his knowledge database. Qin Tian starts processing the acetic acid using the substances he currently has. He prepares a setup and now he can finally make quinine. Actually, the bark needs to be dried first. However, they are in a hurry. Qin Tian uses ethyl acetate to forcefully extract what he needs from the bark. With a few more processes, Qin Tian got what he needed. That night, Hu Zhao continued holding his unconscious sister in his arms, assuring her that their friends would be back soon. Nick notices something and thinks Qin Tian is back. Pokuma doubts it since it looks like a huge group. He then uses his telescope to check. Meanwhile, Qin Tian and Kata came back to their camp. However, they were soldiers from the city-state. The soldiers then discover them. The two then decided to kill the soldiers so their location wouldn't be exposed. The soldiers are also out for blood since the priest promised them rewards. Just then, someone appears from the tree branches above. The man plummeted two soldiers to the ground. Qin Tian and Kata recognized him from Soram's clan and they joined him to fight the soldiers. It didn't take long for them to finish off the soldiers. Hei Yu and the parrot lead Qin Tian and Kata to the new location of the camp. Hei Yu tells them that the soldiers discovered them three hours ago. In a flashback, Pokuma discovers that the approaching group is composed of city-state soldiers. Aruba panics because Qin Tian is not with them. Ragna asks him to get away with the others as he stalls the soldiers with smoke bombs. Hu Zhao and Hei Yu also want to help Ragna. Pokuma notices that they have not been found out yet and that they need to get out as soon as possible. End of the flashback and Hei Yu tells Qin Tian that he stayed back to escort Qin Tian and Kata in case they appeared. The parrot suddenly informs them that they have arrived. Still, Qin Tian wonders how the soldiers easily find their rough location. Pokuma then sees that Qin Tian and the others are back. Hu Zhao is happy because Aya can now be treated. Soon after, Qin Tian administers the drug to Aya and hopes that Aya will wake up by the next day. Hu Zhao loudly expresses his thanks. Qin Tian hopes the medicine works after they did their best to get it. Qin Tian then orders the others to put out the bonfire. Qin Tian leans on a tree since he hasn't rested since yesterday. Just then, his ring flashes. Surprised, Qin Tian hopes it won't act weird like during the time in the dungeons. Suddenly, a woman's voice calls out for Zheng Feng. Qin Tian hasn't seen the ring glow like this before. He also wonders who the woman was. A holographic message then appears and shows that a user named Chewbacca is asking for communication. Suddenly, the system shows that it is being hacked. 
A woman's voice resounds with a scream and a hologram appears. A beautiful woman wearing a modern lab outfit appears out of nowhere. Chin Tian gets surprised and wonders if she is Wang Yichu. The Lada people were surprised that a woman appeared from Chin Tian's ring. Soram and her clan are also in shock. The woman then notices something and looks around the area, looking confused. She can see that Zheng Feng is nowhere to be found. The woman then asked about their identities, how they got the ring, and the whereabouts of the two idiots. Chin Tian can see how charismatic this Wanisan is. Chin Tian asks her to introduce herself before imposing such questions. Chin Tian is irritated that the woman started grilling them. The woman looks at them and sighs. She claims that they won't understand because they are from a different era. She asks them to listen carefully so they understand the situation. Chin Tian kept a poker face and assured them that they wouldn't interrupt her. The woman introduced her as Yi Chu, the director of Zone D3. She wonders if these people have gotten in contact with the two idiots since they got the ring. Her appearance was unexpected but this was a good piece of news for Chin Tian. Chin Tian held back from asking questions since he promised not to interrupt her. After Yi Chu discussed everything, Chin Tian explained that he met Zhang Feng and Xue Lin. The two continue talking while the others are confused about what they are talking about. However, Ragna notices some torches and warns the others that the city-state soldiers are coming. Chin Tian wonders how they are found so easily. Yi Chu then explains that the priest's ring is connected to the laboratory and can see everything in D3. She tells them not to worry later since she tweaked the system a bit and the priest won't find them later. The soldiers only discover the fire that has been put out lately. They are confident in their ability to chase down Chin Tian's group since they know that their priest is communicating with the gods. They left the area while Chin Tian and the others were hiding nearby. Yi Chu claims that her bait is working. She can see the priest being confident while looking at the map. Chin Tian suggests revoking the priest's access to the ring's functions. Yi Chu explains that it will cause some difficulties. Chin Tian is amazed that Yi Chu can easily lure away the enemies and realizes that she expected things to happen like this. Yi Chu then calls it a day and tells Chin Tian to continue their discussion in her laboratory. Chin Tian exclaims that Yi Chu should solve this issue since this is her territory. Yi Chu refuses to help and leaves. Chin Tian's head is hurting due to the information overload. Chin Tian then notices how the others are looking at him. Hu Zhao and Soram's clan starts exclaiming how they want to follow Chin Tian since he is friends with the goddess. Well, Yi Chu does look like a goddess to the Mayans and Chin Tian plans to keep it like that for now. It took Chin Tian an hour to calm down the Mayans. It was their first time to see such technological power. Chin Tian also managed to think through everything and summarized what Yi Chu discussed with them. First, the D3 lab is in the priest temple. Second, the D3 lab can open a space-time portal that can send people back to their original timeline. Third, Yi Chu won't appear again until they reach the D3 lab. Add fourth, the priest had a genetic potion similar to a super soldier serum just like Captain America. So the priest is Captain Mayan? Chin Tian then plans to figure out how to reach the D3 lab. But first, he needs a good sleep since he hadn't closed his eyes for two days. Chin Tian slept through the morning and only woke up in the afternoon. He then starts planning how to infiltrate the D3 lab as he recalls where the guards are stationed. It will turn dark soon and he can use this chance to infiltrate the temple. Later, some tribesmen camping around the city-state are captured. Chin Tian and the others can see that the security got tighter. Chin Tian, Kata, and Nick sneakily jump over the moat while the guards are busy capturing others. The three then arrive at the abandoned temples. Chin Tian explains that no one approached them since they call it a cursed area. It will be easier for them to use the area as a place to hide. They climbed the abandoned pyramid and used it as a lookout. Chin Tian notices that the temple is lit up on one side while the other side is dark and quiet. Chin Tian's group continues to monitor the soldiers' movements. Despite Yi Chu luring others away, there are still a lot of soldiers patrolling around the temple. The spaces between the bridges are the only place where there are no soldiers. The priest must have believed that no one could cross the area. Chin Tian's team can cross the river instead and he decides to make a raft. Soon after, a raft is thrown into the water infested by piranhas. Chin Tian and the others climb down the cliff, however, their raft starts making thumping sounds. The vicious piranhas are eating through the wood. Everyone gets shocked and immediately climbs back on the cliff. It seems like the piranhas have mutated. Using a raft is impossible for now. Chin Tian decides to call it a day for now. The next morning, Chin Tian continued to check things out on the map. He recalls seeing rubber trees and notices from the map that it is not that far away. However, collecting latex is too much work and the others are not in the condition to do labor. Just then, Aya wakes up and asks for food from her brother. Hu Zhao exclaims that Aya is now awake. Chin Tian then checks on Aya who is busy munching food. Chin Tian confirms that Aya is getting better. However, she needs to continue taking the medicine to get better. Hu Zhao cries after learning that Aya is getting well now and lifts her like Simba. Now that the biggest problem is solved, Chin Tian can work on the rubber trees. 
Rubber trees typically grow in tropical forests. It is the most important industrial raw material. Aruba is amazed to see the tree leak something akin to milk. Chin Tian reminds the foodie that latex is not food. Chin Tian tells Hu Zhao not to help them and to take care of Aya instead. Hu Zhao insists on helping since it is his friend's business. Hu Zhao then wonders what Chin Tian is going to use the latex for. Chin Tian explains that he needs it to catch a fish that can knock out a crocodile. Kata wonders if Chin Tian is talking about the electric eels and Chin Tian confirms it. Chin Tian plans to use the electric eels to knock out the vicious piranhas so they can cross the river. To catch the electric eel they need an insulating material like rubber. For now, Chin Tian can produce natural rubber instead of synthetic rubber. To make natural rubber, Chin Tian needs formic acid. He starts making formic acid using oxalic acid and his leftover glycerin. He continues to work on the chemistry processes that we won't explain further. While cooking, Chin Tian wonders how much latex they can collect. The afternoon comes, and Chin Tian starts mixing the latex with formic acid. Nick hands over gloves made from animal skin. They felt like the smell was familiar. Chin Tian reminds them about the red fire ants, which produce the same formic acid. Chin Tian then starts applying the natural latex to the gloves and some cloaks. He hopes things will turn out well the next day. The morning comes and the natural rubber has been dried out. Everyone is amazed at how the formic acid quickly coagulates the latex, which takes two days on its own. Kata is amazed that it feels like he is touching plastic. Chin Tian explains that the two are basically the same and brings out his battery. He turns it on and he finds the rubber glove making successful. He gains some points for it. Later at the river with electric eels, Chin Tian reaches out for an electric eel and tosses it toward Kata. Aruba can see that they look like harmless mudfish, but Pokuma warns Chin Tian that they are quite dangerous. Curiosity got into Aruba's head and reached for the electric eel. Of course, he gets electrocuted. While Aruba is unconscious, Chin Tian explains that the infiltration team will be composed of him and Kata while Ragna, Nick, Pokuma, and Aruba wait from the outside. Chin Tian leaves the rest of the group to Ragna's care. He asks Pokuma to watch over the reckless Aruba. Chin Tian reminds the three who will be on standby to ignore things if the temple suddenly gets rowdy. Chin Tian recalls Yi Chu's words and assumes that they will be fine. Hey Yu eavesdropped on them. Sorum calls out his attention and Hei Yu apologizes for being distracted. Chin Tian then approaches them. Soram is surprised to know that Chin Tian is leaving. However, Soram already swore her allegiance to Chin Tian and plans to say goodbye to her clan. Hu Zhao also wants to follow Chin Tian, but Chin Tian reminds him that they are currently wanted in the city state. He asks Hu Zhao and Aya to go back to their tribe. The siblings got shocked and Chin Tian wonders what is wrong. The two are saddened upon learning that they are being abandoned. Hei Yu appears and explains that Chin Tian was given a mission by the goddess, which is why Chin Tian can't bring them along. Chin Tian makes it clear that he is not abandoning them. He feels grateful for Hei Yu's assistance. Chin Tian left in secret after only informing Soram and Hei Yu. It would be trouble to tell everyone since they now revere Chin Tian as God's messenger, after Yi Chu suddenly appeared in front of them. Chin Tian's group silently left in the afternoon after saying goodbye to Soram, Hei Yu, and the siblings. However, Chin doesn't know that this is not a parting goodbye. That night, Ragna's group sees that Chin Tian's group was successful in lowering the raft. Chin Tian lowers a latex bag and Kata receives it. Chin Tian tells Kata to hurry and bring out the electric eel since the piranhas have sensed their movement now for sure. Speaking of the devils, piranhas are approaching their raft. Chin Tian tells Kata to hold still. The chilling electric eel notices the piranhas and lets out a strong electric current. The water shines bright and Chin Tian and Kata check on the water. Cooked piranhas start floating to the water surface. Now they are safe to cross the river. Kata is amazed at how the electric eel was effective and feels the labor during preparation was fulfilling. Chin Tian and Kata then started paddling the raft. Chin Tian notices how the piranhas have mutated and takes note that he must be prepared for unexpected things like these. The two then reach the other side, but it is too much to climb with a single rope. Kata offers to go ahead since he is experienced with rock climbing. Kata then leads the way, and Chin Tian follows him. The two then reach the top but immediately hide as soon as the soldiers appear. They come out and sneak through the bushes. Chin Tian then starts figuring out how to get inside the temple. It's a good thing that the temple is heavily lit. Sand eagles can scout with no problems. The sand eagle flies over the temple and Chin Tian uses his eyesight to check on the guards. Chin Tian orders Sand Eagle to make a distraction. The Sand Eagle started squawking and it got the attention of the guards. Ragna's group notices the signal. Ragna asks Pokuma and Aruba to cover him and Nick. He reminds Nick about Chin Tian's plan. The two then start moving and split up. Pokuma lights a fire arrow and shoots it toward the temple. A soldier thinks it is a shooting star. However, he was late to notice that it was not, and he gets shot by the flaming arrow in the most dangerous part where a man could get hit. The poor soldier screams in pain. The other soldiers heard about the poor soldier and they went to check it out. 
Ragna finds his chance and starts charging toward the gatekeepers with a sword and shield. He easily knocks out the soldiers on the west side, while Nick slashes through the soldiers on the south side. The soldiers are now alerted that there are intruders. Just then, soldiers come pouring out, and Nick and Ragna start running away toward the forest. Chin Tien only ordered them to draw the soldiers' attention and leave as soon as more came out. The priest immediately got the report about the two intruders. A dozen of their soldiers died and most of them are now chasing the two in the forest. The priest sighs as he thinks of them as useless. He then tells them to leave and continues staring at his screen. He has been watching the movement of Chin Tien's group without sleep, and they just keep moving around even at midnight. He complains about how tiring it is even for the soldiers pursuing them. The priest can't believe that two people came back to attack. Just then he realizes something. Most of the soldiers are gone but four more guards are left behind to guard the dungeon. Chin Tian then tells Kata what to do next. The two use their sneaking skills to pass the guards and enter the dungeon. Chin Tian notices that the temple hasn't brought in new slaves since they escaped from there. The two then arrive at the stone wall which was described by Yichu. Kata wonders if they will use a bomb, however they haven't brought any gunpowder. Still, Chin Tian is well prepared for this and rummages through his back. He brings out bamboo containers that have carbide and sulfuric acid in them. They then pour some of the carbide into the small cracks. Just when Chin Tian is going to pour the sulfuric acid next, incoming footsteps are heard by them. The priest has come with his soldiers. He knew that there would be infiltrators in the dungeon. They suddenly discover a pair of shadows. However, they are only rats sticking against the wall near the torch. The rats ran off and the soldier thinks the infiltrators can use witchcraft and transform into rats. The priest gets mad and slaps the soldier. The priest looks around and notices the small cracks in the carbide. He then orders the soldiers to look for the infiltrators even if they have to open cracks. With the priest's orders the soldiers scurried through the dungeon. They stab haystacks with the spears and continue to check every nook and cranny. Chin Tian watches them while hiding in a haystack. Good thing Chin Tian was quick to hide with Kata. There are a lot of them, and it will be hard to kill them. So Chin Tian plans to attack the priest directly instead. The priest is heavily guarded but that also makes his position constrained. Chin Tian and Kata then decide to kill the priest. Kata comes out of the haystack and leaps toward the priest. Soldiers cover for the priest but Chin Tian suddenly appears and steps on Kata's back. Chin Tian leaps toward the priest and the priest is glad that Chin Tian came out. Chin Tian felt something off. The priest smirks as he grabs the sword with his bare hands. The priest calls Chin Tian careless and tries to smack him with his mace. Chin Tian uses his superpower and quickly backs off. Kata gets worried but Chin Tian claims that he is okay. The priest then introduces himself as Stuville. He claims he has been waiting for them. He realized that he was being tricked by the group and thought that Chin Tian would come to the D3 lab. Stuville then announces that he will kill them as punishment. Meanwhile, Nick is doing well in luring the soldiers away from the city-state. Ragna is also doing his best but the soldiers' persistence is already pissing him off. From the top of the abandoned pyramid, Pokuma fires off arrows as support. Soldiers are killed but of course Pokuma's location is discovered at the same time. Seeing them distracted, Ragna lights up a smoke bomb and throws it at the soldiers. Aruba gets worried and wonders if they need to support Chin Tian. Recalling Chin Tian's words, Pokuma tells Aruba to stay and wait. He reminds Aruba to trust Chin Tian and continues monitoring. Just then, he notices two individuals and wonders why they are there. Sand Eagle also notices it. Back inside the dungeon, Chin Tian laughs out loud at the priest's joke. The priest claims that Chin Tian and Kata can't escape. Chin Tian then tries to respond but forgets his name. Stuville shouts out his name. Stuville thinks that Chin Tian is still unaware of his power. Chin Tian then comments on how huge Stuville's eye bags are waiting for Chin Tian. Stuville asks Chin Tian how they can move without rest every day at every moment. Chin Tian decides to tell Stuville about it. He claims that his ring is more advanced and that Stuville's ring is inferior compared to his. Stuville gets pissed off by Chin Tian's bluff. However, Stuville also realizes that Chin Tian is not showing any fear at all. It is Stuville who is getting anxious right now. Chin Tian then claims that he still has some tricks. He pulls out a bamboo stick. Stuville orders his soldiers to kill Chin Tian and Kata. Just then they hear a loud noise from the dungeon's entrance. Chin Tian did expect someone to come. A soldier comes flying in and Hu Zhao and Hei Yu come as reinforcements. Hu Zhao is glad to see his friend again. Using Sand Eagle's shared vision, Chin Tian discovers the two infiltrating the temple. Stuville then announces that he will give out rewards to whoever kills the infiltrators. Chin Tian then tells his allies to hang in there while he gets busy for a minute. Kata and Hu Zhao shout as they comply. The two then block and protect Chin Tian. Chin Tian then opens the bamboo and pours acetic acid into the cracks with carbide. A chemical reaction starts and produces calcium sulfate. Chin Tian then brings out a water bottle and gulps some water. He sprays the water from his mouth over the cracks. 
the calcium sulfate starts reacting with the water and explodes like a bomb, cracking open the wall. Stubel can only curse, which leaves him no choice but to use something. He cracks his staff and a vial appears. Is this the serum that Yi Chu was talking about? Chin Tian knows that the substance is not something Mayans can produce. Stubel then injects the serum into himself. As the serum enters his bloodstream, Stubel's body starts changing. His heart is pumping harder than before, enough to make him scream in pain. Stubel screams out loud like a berserker. Chin Tian notices that the cracks are gradually increasing. Stubil then dashes forward and even swats aside his own soldiers. Kata quickly covers for Chin Tian. He can sense a power more terrifying than Salmonson's. However, a warrior like him should always face someone stronger. Stubil quickly dodges Kata's spear and counters with his own. The impact was so strong that it sent Kata flying. Kata can feel the numbness in his hands after defending Stubil's strike. Stubil attacks one more time and Kata blocks. He almost cracked his skull open. Stubil overpowers Kata. Kata is already saying his goodbyes to Chin Tian when Chin Tian surprisingly appears behind Stuville. However, Stuville notices Chin Tian and attacks instead. Chin Tian can't believe Stuville looks like he's got eyes on his back and dodges. Captain Mayan, I mean Stuville is now stronger and fiercer because of the power serum. Chin Tian gets anxious because even the strongest Lada warrior was just swatted to the side like a rag. Stuville attacks Chin Tian instead. Chin Tian dodges all of Stuville's attacks. Stuvil then mocks Chin Tian for bluffing before and wonders if he is only good at talking. Stuvil claims that Chin Tian will die at his hands. Meanwhile, Kata keeps beating down other soldiers around the area. Knowing that they will be rewarded, they flock on Kata. Chin Tian gets worried that Kata is outnumbered. However, he is also quite busy with Stuvil who is relentlessly attacking him. Stuvil tells Chin Tian to stop worrying for others and focus on himself instead. Hu Zhe exclaims that they will be on Chin Tian's side soon. Even with Hu Zhao and Hei Yu, Chin Tian knows that they are still at a disadvantage. A soldier suddenly tries to attack Chin Tian for the reward, but Stuville knocks out his own soldier. He orders his men to get out of his way. Chin Tian suddenly got an idea. He then starts mocking Stuville that he kept missing his attacks for a while now. An offended Stuville tells Chin Tian to die with a scream. Chin Tian continues mocking him while leading him somewhere. The soldiers panic as they see the rampaging Stuville coming their way. Chin Tian runs in between the soldiers. On the other hand, Stuville smacks his soldiers away. Hei Yu wonders what is happening. Hu Zhao tells him that this is their chance. They knocked out more soldiers and decided to assist Chin Tian. More soldiers went away to assist Stuville. Only a few are left to confront Kata. Seeing their few numbers, Kata then easily defeats them with no issue. Meanwhile, Chin Tian is still playing tag with Stuville. Stuville gets more frustrated. His soldiers call his attention and discover that almost all of them are incapacitated. He just realized that he went berserk fueled by Chin Tian's teasing. He gets mad at Chin Tian who is still teasing him. He describes how beaten up the soldiers are by the priest that they believe in. The enraged Stuville orders his remaining soldiers to attack Chin Tian. However, the soldiers are now faltering. Stuville then decides to take action by himself. A spear suddenly comes flying and Stuville dodges. Kata, Heiyu, and Hu Zhao have come to assist Chin Tian. Kata tells Chin Tian to go and do whatever he needs to do while they stall Stuville. Chin Tian then leaves and runs toward the dungeon. However, he already reached his limit and is getting tired. He worries because despite being alone, Stuville is still strong. Even if he redeems for new abilities, he won't be able to use them. The only choice he has right now is to open the lab's door. An enraged Stuville gets mad that Chin Tian left without permission. He then chases for Chin Tian, leaving the others. Chin Tian hears some noise behind him and discovers Hei Yu thrown toward him. Chin Tian catches Hei Yu and checks on him. Kata and Hu Zhao are trying their best to hold down Stuville. Chin Tian recalls Zhang Feng's explanation that the ring can summon a shield. However, it will consume a lot of power and the ring will turn into a scrap. Hei Yu then asks Chin Tian if he can snuff out the flames in the dungeon. He claims that no one can defeat him in the dark. Seeing Hei Yu's cloudy eyes, Chin Tian realizes that Hei Yu is blind. Chin Tian then lends his sword to Hei Yu. Chin Tian then extinguishes the flames and Hei Yu attacks Stuville from behind with a surprise attack. Stuville gets slashed and he orders his remaining soldiers to do something. However, everyone is having a hard time in the darkness. Stuville still notices Chin Tian in a direction. Hei Yu appears to confront Stuville. Stuville dodges as he wonders what is going on. He notices that Hei Yu is more agile than before. Stuville realizes that Hei Yu must have trained his ears to have his hearing amplified. Everyone, we are seeing Captain Mayan versus Tribal Daredevil. Hei Yu is amazed by Chin Tian's sword and swears to take Stuville's life using it. Stuville is worrying because he can't see that well and knows that he is at a disadvantage. He then runs off somewhere and uses his ring to emit light. Using his heightened senses due to the serum, he looks for Chin Tian. Chin Tian is amazed that Stuville suddenly got clever. Just then, more people scream in the darkness, making Chin Tian wonder what is happening. Everyone tries their best to be calm. Stuville orders them to be aware of their surroundings. Still, more soldiers are letting out their dying screams. 
Shin Tian knows that only Hei Yu can do this. Stuville gets anxious as his soldier's numbers are thinning out. Stuville cries in panic and starts waving his spear left and right without knowing that he is hitting his own soldiers. Hei Yu then appears beside Chin Tian. Chin Tian wonders what is happening and Hei Yu explains that Stuville is going crazy and hitting his own men. Chin Tian then realizes that this is a ruse to lure him out. Stuville is pretending to have gone mad and his soldiers are just waiting to attack while lying on the ground. However, Chin Tian claims that Stuville has missed one thing. He then whispers something to Hei Yu and Hei Yu agrees with the plan. Stuville continues swinging his spear. He also wonders why Chin Tian is not making any moves right now. Just then a rock flies in a certain direction and Stuville hears it. Stuville then hits something but it is only a haystack. More stones are being thrown in other directions and they are making Stuville confused. Chin Tian is just silently laughing and throwing another stone. More stones follow, hitting different places. Stuville is getting confused. Chin Tian is stalling time while Hei Yu pours the remaining acetic acid into the cracks. Suddenly a blinding light comes out of the crack. Chin Tian gets surprised. Stuville is getting more confused by the sudden event. Hei Yu managed to widen the cracks. Stuville panics as he realizes that there is something more powerful than his ring. He then tries to leave and goes to a secret door. The soldiers see him running and they also follow. Kata assists Hu Zhao, who wonders if it is fine to let them go. Chin Tian tells them to ignore their enemies. He is thankful that Hei Yu is with them because he fought amazingly with the priest in the dark. He claims he has lived all this time in darkness and only relies on his hearing. Just then, the crack widens, and the lab's door appears. Chin Tian then uses his ring to activate the door. The system then welcomes them. The door opens and Hu Zhao wonders if the gods are welcoming them into their abode. He claims that this is the true temple of the goddess. Chin Tian tells them to go in. It is really different from where they came from. Another door opens and Yi Chu comes out of nowhere. Yi Chu wonders if Zhang Feng gave Chin Tian a modified version of the potion. Chin Tian wonders what Yi Chu is talking about. Yi Chu might have been suspicious of Chin Tian's super speed. Chin Tian asks if she is watching them. Yi Chu claims she only appeared right now because she is also saving on power. Yi Chu tells Chin Tian to enable the backup energy. She also confirms that she saw everything since she is part of the lab. While walking, Chin Tian wonders why they are not using any transportation. Yi Chu apologizes and explains that the D3 lab is not the same as the big labs like the Wufang lab. She only had basic equipment. Yi Chu then snaps her fingers and transport appears. She tells them to hop in, and the men follow her like chicks following their mother hen. She claims that the vehicle is autonomous and sets off immediately. They travel through the lab with sheer speed and soon arrive at the infirmary. Yi Chu activates and opens the capsules. She orders the three tribesmen to enter them. Chin Tian wonders how long these Dragon Ball-like capsules can heal them. Yi Chu is not sure but the wounded will undergo hydrotherapy, and the medicine will hasten their recovery. The three then got inside and got locked. Liquid starts pouring into the capsules. The three tribesmen get shocked and wonder if they will drown to death. Yi Chu tells them to relax so they can breathe normally. Kata inhales air as much as he can and finally gets covered by the liquid. Kata soon realizes that he can breathe. Yi Chu commends how they trust Chin Tian a lot. The other lot of people also arrive in the dungeon. They went in after waiting for so long and discovered the lab's door. They wonder if they should also get in. Hokuma reminds them how terrified that priest was when exiting the dungeon. He knows Chin Tian is alright. Nick suggests taking a rest and Ragna agrees. Meanwhile, Chin Tian gets excited and wants to try the capsule too. Yi Chu then snaps her fingers and another capsule appears. However, the tank got a different liquid suited for the patient and it might produce a hypnotic effect on him. Chin Tian wants to rest and sleep but he can do it later since the others are waiting for him outside. Yi Chu then wonders why Chin Tian didn't use what Zhang Feng has left behind. Chin Tian claims that he doesn't want to dig himself into a hole. If he used the shield then the ring would be useless. Chin Tian then wonders what was up with the priest's genetic potion. Yi Chu then decides to check the records back to when she awakened. She then notices Chin Tian looking around and claims that he is looking for a stool to sit on. She then discovers the footage of Chin Tian meeting the two idiots. Yi Chu then claims it is fine not to listen to her. Chin Tian then sits on the floor and asks for her story while they are extracting the data from the ring. Yi Chu then claims that the situation of the D3 lab is the same as the Wu Fang lab. They also experience time turbulence. Everyone died and Yi Chu is the only one who managed to upload her consciousness into the computer at the last minute. During the tragedy, Wu Feng went into standby mode to maintain the whole treasure island and uses as much as little energy to go on. On the other hand, D3 was not affected much by the time turbulence and didn't use much energy compared to Wu Feng and the dome was also taken with it. Ever since that day, Yi Chu started investigating the cause of the accident and figured it out after a year. 
she started reverse engineering the data recorded and ultimately discovered the way to return to the original world. The process was indeed long, and it took Yichu nearly 60 years to figure a way to open the cracks in space-time. Qin Tian gets excited that there is a way home. Yichu did mention it the first time they met. Qin Tian felt the beat-up he experienced was useless since the ring was not significant. However, Yichu explains that she needed invaluable data from the ring for the scientific development of their country. Of course, it is not important for the young Qin Tian. Qin Tian then claims that he is obligated to contribute to his country and he feels honored. Qin Tian then asks what happened next. Yichu then tells him that the D3 lab went to standby mode. She discovered that the D3 lab doesn't have enough energy to open the portal between two timelines. It was a certain amount way beyond anyone's imagination. She then mentions how Qin Tian's group is from the 21st century, but Qin Tian claims that there are some from the 20th century. Yichu then mentions that a different timeline needs a different amount of energy. Qin Tian then complains because he knows Yichu can produce energy on her own like sending out robots to build nuclear reactors or something. Suddenly, they discover the Mayans banging on the lab's door. Qin Tian is so relaxed that he is inside the fortified lab. Qin Tian then asks Yichu to continue. Before shutting down the lab, Yichu programmed it to reactivate once someone arrives at the lab. She also sent out a drone to find human beings but it never found anyone. Suddenly the lab activates after a hundred years. Yichu knows that it is an outsider since the lab personnel were wiped out. She soon finds out that the detected humans were Mayans from ancient times. At first, Yichu intended not to interfere with their lives. However, the mutated beasts and plans imposed dangers on them. She appeared before them using the drone as a projector and she suddenly got revered as a god. She then established a subordinate supervisor relationship with them, and she provided the knowledge that they needed. Qin Tian got surprised that the Mayans' technology was from Yichu. Soon after, she ordered them to create solar panels, and since then, the lab was hibernating to save energy. At that time, the Mayans continued developing cultural knowledge based on what she taught them. The Mayan pyramids were their one product since they needed a high place for the solar panels. This is a shocking discovery for Qin Tian, but the sacrifice ritual was not an idea from Yichu. Qin Tian then wonders why the panels were destroyed. Yichu explains that the Mayan civilization has reached a new height with a growing population. She woke up for the second time and selected some of them as her students. She made clear that she was not a god but they still revere her. She imparted them a ring after she taught them everything. It was meant to protect her students whom she left the task to spread civilization. Her students' predecessors then soon called themselves priests and held the responsibility for advancement for hundreds of years. However, a scheming one has appeared. Qin Tian wonders if it is the one from outside. Now that Qin Tian mentioned it, Yichu activates something and the door outside stars shining. A laser beam shoots out and hits Stuville's head. Seeing that Suville has fallen dead, the soldiers run away knowing that they have offended the goddess. Yichu claims he abused his authority and it is better for him to die. Qin Tian feels like he is also being warned. Qin Tian wonders who the priest Yichu was talking about. She mentions it was Black Soil and mentions how the Mayans use simple words as names. She recalls how ambitious Black Soil was and made a plan to take over the Mayan kingdom. He went to assassinate the other priests and used Yichu's name to control things behind the scene through the king. It was the start of the Age of Theocracy, and Black Soil's family ruled the Mayan civilization through different civilizations. Qin Tian wonders why there is still a king if Black Soil is already claiming the place as his own. Yichu explains that Black Soil wanted a shield in case of natural disasters, sacrificing the king. They also went ahead to destroy the solar panels and surround the main temple with boulders to prevent any treacherous factors. The time that Yichu woke up again, she found herself trapped and didn't have a choice but to lock down the lab for good. She saved some energy in case of an emergency like when she appeared for the first time in front of Qin Tian. Just then, the system suddenly lets out an alarm. Qin Tian gets surprised to see the king with other citizens apologizing to Yichu. They continue to beg for mercy. The soldiers went to the king after the real ruler was killed. Qin Tian wonders what the goddess will do. Yichu claims it is better to lie since Black Soil's line is already wiped out. She then reappears before the Mayans and mentions Stuville's arrogance. She then forgives them since they acknowledge their mistake. The king then starts praising Yichu. Qin Tian can't help but recall how he also used his position to gain the trust of the Lada people as God's messenger. However, his fake identity is making sense now, and he plans to lead them further in the future. Yichu then uses this chance to push the responsibility to Qin Tian by appointing him as her divine incarnation. Suddenly, the capsules started opening. Hei Yu, Kata, and Hu Zhao can't believe that they got better in such a short span of time. However, long-term issues like Hei Yu's impairment were not cured. Qin Tian then interrogates Hu Zhao and Hei Yu. Hei Yu claims that he overheard the plan and told Hu Zhao about it. They were just observing at first but soon jumped in after sensing that Qin Tian was in danger. Qin Tian then thanks them and everyone laughs as Hu Zhao exclaims that they are friends. 
Yi Chu then comes back because the calculation report is done. She claims that it is both good and bad. They can open the portal, but it would only be up to the Mayan period. Yi Chu further exclaims that the lab has only enough energy for up to a hundred years, and they can only manage to open the portal to the Mayan period. Qin Tian claims it is a good thing while looking disheartened. Hu Zhe tells him not to give up, and Qin Tian realizes that he still has them. Qin Tian then wonders if they can put back the solar panels and replace human force with robots. Yi Chu agrees, but it will still take a long time to accumulate energy. She is afraid that Qin Tian will die of old age before that. Qin Tian gets depressed again. He suddenly remembers the dome Yi Chu mentioned before. Yi Chu explains that the dome lab was the central lab in Biosphere 3. It serves as a solar core, which is an emergency energy source for the lab. If Qin Tian can find it, then they will have enough energy to send Qin Tian to his timeline. Qin Tian is glad that he now has a chance to get back home. He then wonders if Yi Chu didn't mention it on purpose from the start. Qin Tian realizes how much of a teaser Yi Chu is. Qin Tian then wonders how to get there. The broken ring he got from Zheng Feng should have led them there, but it pointed in the D3 lab's directions instead. Yi Chu then claims that there is no problem with the ring, but with Biosphere 3 itself. After the accident, the dome lab was swept up somewhere after the Biosphere 3's continental plates shattered. Zhang Feng from Treasure Island 2 didn't know that and only set up the only coordinates they knew, the D3 lab. That was the reason Qin Tian and his team encountered a confusing situation. Yi Chu claims that the initial problem is solved since she added the dome lab's coordinates to the ring. She also added another ring that can bring out a shield, so Qin Tian won't worry about erasing the data in Zhang Feng's ring. Qin Tian then wonders if there are still genetic potions so he can train super soldiers. Yi Chu then shows a projection of the dead Stuville with a shriveled body. She then sets the corpse on fire and it turns to nothing. She mentions the side effects. Qin Tian then confesses that he didn't get a potion from Zhang Feng, but he made a breakthrough instead after getting through the space-time turbulence. Yi Chu suddenly gets near Qin Tian and scans him. She discovers that Qin Tian has mutated due to the space-time storm. She discovers that Qin Tian has surpassed 99.9% .9 of humanity from his era. Yi Chu now wants to do a full checkup on Qin Tian, but the latter refuses. Yi Chu then shares the information that there are other potions out there. One can increase one's maximum lifespan, and Yi Chu recommends it for Qin Tian. Qin Tian thanks her and asks for it, but she doesn't have it. She claims he might find it at the dome lab. Qin Tian feels sad that he can't take anything from D3. Yi Chu then tells him that Qin Tian can use the capsules anytime he wants. However, Qin Tian knows that Yi Chu is after his body to be examined. Qin Tian then claims that he wants to get excused now. Yi Chu escorts them back outside using the speedy transport from before. After a minute, they arrived outside and the speed was still too much for everyone. The farewell was too abrupt, but there is one more thing Qin Tian needs to handle. The Mayans, who are referring to him now as their priest. Nick and Pakuma come out of hiding and Qin Tian asks if they are alright. Nick assures them that they are okay except for scratches from sharp leaves. Qin Tian knew they were hungry and invited them for a meal. Meanwhile, back at the daybreak, the lot of people are living comfortably while waiting for Qin Tian and the rest. The elders wonder where Ellen and Jessica went. In the mangrove area, a pheasant bird is being admired by Jessica who is sketching its appearance. Jessica claims that this is a musk pheasant that is endemic to tropical rainforests. It looks like ancient dinosaurs which is why Jessica is researching it. However, Ellen complains about how stinky the area is. It is normal since musk pheasants are known for their strong odor. Just then, a familiar eagle appears and the musk pheasant got alerted. It dives into the water and Jessica can't help but get mad at Sand Eagle. Sand Eagle gets anxious as it delivers a piece of paper to Ellen. The two girls read Qin Tian's letter and learn about what happened with their Mayan expedition. Back in the Mayan city-state, everyone helped themselves to some delicious meat. Qin Tian then suggests making a toast. However, the others don't know the concept. Qin Tian teaches them how to do it. A female servant appears informing Qin Tian that they have roasted lamb meat. Qin Tian expresses his gratitude to the king and swears to grant blessings to their kingdom. The female servant is ecstatic to hear that. Night comes and Qin Tian wants to resign for the day and check things tomorrow instead. Suddenly the ring glows and Yi Chu comes out scolding Qin Tian for being late. She then shares the news that she is done building the space-time portal. Qin Tian is surprised that it was built so fast after assuming that it will take months. Instead of sleeping, Qin Tian runs off to meet Yi Chu. While riding the transport, Qin Tian still can't believe that the portal was done overnight. He then enters the lab and discovers Yi Chu in a bikini while chilling on the beach. God damn that body. Seeing that Qin Tian has arrived, Yi Chu snaps her fingers and the environment changes back to the laboratory. Qin Tian discovers the energy core that powers up the D3 lab. Qin Tian asks if it is possible to postpone opening the space-time portal because he needs to gather enough supplies for the journey. 
Yichu claims that it is too late since there is less remaining energy. The island will sink soon, and Yichu advises Chin Tian to leave within half a month. She claims that Chin Tian can gather enough supplies within that time frame for a half-year journey. Chin Tian wonders if Yichu now knows the exact coordinates. Yichu has already uploaded the data to Chin Tian's ring. Of course, Chin Tian hasn't checked on it since he was tired and hungry. Chin Tian then recalls that Yichu is currently a part of the lab and remembers what happened to Zhang Feng and Xue Lin. Yichu confirms that she will also disappear once the lab disappears. Biologically speaking, Yichu is already dead and is only a piece of data right now. She is already happy that she met Chin Tian, who brought her the data. However, she was indeed alone and just served as the lab's guardian for a very long time. Chin Tian then thanks her personally and on behalf of the country for her great contribution to the scientific community. Yichu turns around after hearing how dramatic Chin Tian was and tells him to get out so she can continue sunbathing. Yichu silently cries as Chin Tian leaves the lab. Chin Tian then meets the others and wants to talk to Hu Zhao and Heiyu about something. He tells them that they are going to leave the island and head to a faraway destination. Hu Zhao wants to join but Chin Tian tells him that the goddess already planned to send the Mayans somewhere more abundant and spacious. This is Chin Tian's only way to convince them to return to their original world. Hu Zhao agrees quickly and Chin Tian asks the others to help him prepare supplies for the journey. Chin Tian looked for the king's assistance to gather as many supplies as they could. Afterward, he had some alone time to check on the new information in the ring. He also went around to discover anything good and useful. He also has time to join Yichu for a conversation, but he is just keeping that lonely person company. After five days, they have gathered enough supplies and it is time for Chin Tian's group to leave. They can now go back to the dawn in a shorter time since they got a guide, hey you. On the other hand, Hey Yu looks like he is in a bad mood since this is a sudden farewell. Two days later, Jessica wonders why Chin Tian is not yet back since they knew it would be today based on the previous letter sent. Ellen tells her not to worry and to wait a bit more. Suddenly, they hear rustling in the nearby woods. Someone hanging on the coconut tree exclaims that Chin Tian and the others have arrived. The group then comes out of the thick woods. Ellen and Jessica immediately jump into the arms of Chin Tian, asking him if they miss them. Chin Tian exclaims that he did. Soon after, Chin Tian presents the Mayans with an Angry Bird plushie as a present. Aya calls it ugly but Soram says otherwise. Chin Tian wants to give it to Earth as a farewell present. He then tells Aya not to forget a kind big brother like him, but Aya claims Chin Tian is an uncle. Ellen and Jessica give Chin Tian some time to say his farewells to the Mayans. It didn't take long and a lot of people are done loading up the supplies on the ship. Chin Tian then moves to ride the boat. The Mayans hope they see Chin Tian again but only if fate brings them together. Chin Tian waves his hand for his last farewell. He knows they won't meet again and is glad to have met them. That night everyone had a welcome back party on the daybreak's deck. The wives are now forcing their husbands to eat more food since it is visible that Chin Tian hasn't eaten well lately. However, Chin Tian only shared their tough journey and didn't include the indulgent experiences they had. He tries to silence Nick about it. Ellen and Jessica insist on giving Chin Tian leisure time, but Chin Tian backs off for now, claiming that he doesn't deserve it. Later in his room, Chin Tian checks the list of supplies he got from the Mayans. He plans to sort them out but he resigns in the middle since he is tired and sleepy. Sometime after, the daybreak encounters a raging storm. Chin Tian tells the others not to worry since they have experienced this kind of situation before. The daybreak continues to travel through the stormy sea with Chin Tian's leadership and Jessica's maneuvering skills. They manage to survive and get away from the storm quickly since everyone was prepared this time around. Kata then wonders why Chin Tian called everyone on the deck. Chin Tian claims he's got some good news and activates the ring. Everyone gets surprised as someone appears out of nowhere as a hologram. Yichu compliments their ship and Chin Tian's stamina since he has two wives beside him. Nick suddenly starts blushing and is about to say something. Yichu notices her and corrects herself, saying that Chin Tian got three of them. Yichu then talks to Jessica, and the two start complimenting each other's beauty. Chin Tian asks Yichu to save the compliments for later, and asks to start discussing the main topic now. The spotlight is on Yichu and she then shows something to everyone. She shows footage of the Mayan city-state. Chin Tian asked her before to show them how the space-time portal would open and send the Mayans back home. Just then, the city-state starts rumbling and everyone gets shocked. The Mayans are also panicking but they recall the king announcing that the goddess would help them transfer to lands with more food and resources. The main Mayan temple then lights up and the space-time portal opens. A bright light shoots out into the sky. The Mayans wonder if the goddess is angry. Suddenly, some of them also started lighting up. One by one, the Mayans are getting sucked into the sky. Everyone is pulled into the space-time portal until no one is left in the city-state. The skies turn back to normal as the city-state became abandoned. Suddenly, Chin Tian gets surprised by someone shouting Yichu's name. Yichu claims that there is not much energy left after the transfer. She can only wish them a happy trip. 
As she disappears, Yichu can only say thanks to Chin Tian. She feels thankful that someone went out and wasted their time with her until his last moments. She asks them to take care. The lab's core loses its power, and everything inside the D3 lab shuts down. Chin Tian assures everyone that the goddess went to a better place and calls it a day. The girls can see how down Chin Tian is. Jessica wonders if they need to console him, but Ellen tells her to leave Chin Tian alone for now. Meanwhile, the Mayans wake up somewhere. Aya exclaims that it is the same environment they have had. However, they left all tools and supplies in D3. Heiyu suggests starting everything from scratch. Hu Zhao panics that they lost their belongings, including the five fables he wrote down after Chin Tian shared the stories with them. He then plans to write them down before he forgets about them. The king suddenly gets their attention and announces the start of their new civilization, abolishing slavery along the way. Suddenly the weather gets bad and rain comes pouring down. The king then leads them all to shelter. Back at the daybreak the kids are playing as usual and Ellen and Jessica commend their energy. Surprised, Jessica notices something. Chin Tian is in his room checking his system points. He made some purchases that are very useful in the D3 area. He made new items along the way too. He then browses for new skills to buy and thinks that the bull's strength is useful. He recalls having the speed to beat Stuville but lacking the strength to fight back. Curious, Chin Tian checks on the store's mystery items. He discovers a new list with vague descriptions. He complains about how he needs to buy and use them first before he can know their full description. He then purchases something and prepares himself for the usual pain. However, it doesn't hurt this time. Chin Tian also notices how the homepage has changed. He got a skill, a weaker version of Wolverine's regenerative ability. He also gains a skill that increases his agility while holding his breath. Chin Tian also has a poison tolerance skills. Chin Tian really went on a shopping spree and lost most of his points. He also checks the two rings he got. The two rings can be used for communications. He names the one with Data the Pentagon and the one with a shield the D3 ring. Just then, the ship violently shakes and Chin Tian wonders what is happening. Jessica announces over the intercom that they are on a highway and will sail faster. Curious about the highway thing, Chin Tian comes out and asks Jessica about it. Ellen tells him to take a look. Chin Tian then checks the sea and discovers a whirlpool. Jessica explains that this one is an ocean current that forms when the water current is fast. Chin Tian then recalls the geography class he had about ocean water movements and realizes that the daybreak is moving fast because of it. Ellen hopes that it will lead them to the A1 zone, and Jessica claims that it will be up to their luck. Feeling that the wind is too strong, Chin Tian tells the girls to get inside the cabin. Ellen now realizes why the Mayan and Chinese civilizations share some similarities. The Mayans from the D3 area passed their knowledge to the Mayans in the Americas, which resulted in the Classic period. The Mayan civilization was divided into three periods, the Pre-Classic, Classic, and Post-Classic period. The Classic period was the most glorious time of the Mayan civilization, and it happened overnight. Archaeologists had a lot of theories like how the Mayans came from outer space or were backed by aliens because of the modern-looking murals and artifacts. As an archaeologist, Jessica feels pumped up knowing this revelation. The reason they were adept at astronomy is because their teacher is a top researcher from the future. Jessica then wonders why their calendars are different. Chin Tian explains that they used Yichu's calendar from her era when planets experienced a significant change in position. That is why the Mayans' calendar was similar to that of their era. Meanwhile, Pokuma notices something from afar. A ship is approaching them. Pokuma immediately reported it to Chin Tian. Jessica claims that they have seen the ship before. She claims that it was the ghost ship that they had encountered before. Everyone is amazed by its structure and weapons for the second time. However, Pokuma claims that he can see the ship clearly this time because there is no mist around, especially the black flag with a skeleton on it. Chin Tian checks on the ship himself and realizes that it is a pirate ship. Chin Tian thinks that things are different this time and orders the others to go back inside the cabins. He orders Kata and the others to be on high alert and start the paddle wheel. Chin Tian has the feeling of avoiding them at all costs. Just then he notices the pirate ship bring out paddles to speed up. The ship is clearly after them. Nick comments on how the people on the ship have fair skin unlike them. Chin Tian checks on the ship and discovers pirates checking on them too. Chin Tian can see that they look like an army with a noble aura. Meanwhile the pirates are amazed at the daybreak's speed and movement while assuming that it is only a ghost ship. The bearded man Schwartz comments on how the spirits move and calls them lowly. The mustached man Captain Chadley warns Schwartz to watch his mouth or they will get back on him. Schwartz laughs and asks Chadley not to joke around. He claims that the Daybreak's crossbows are inferior to their cannons. Chadley reminds him not to be aggressive since the ship might be a treasure ship. They are glad that they are free at sea to bring offerings to their king. Schwartz complains that they lack women on board. Chin Tian can clearly see that they are speaking in English and realizes that the ship is real. He is sure that they saw the daybreak before at the same time they encountered each other's mirages. 
They must not know that the Daybreak is not a ghost ship. Chin Tian decides to speed up. Just then, Schwartz got bored chasing the Daybreak and tossed his bottle toward it. The bottle almost hit Chin Tian and crashed on the deck. The pirates were surprised that the ship was solid. Chin Tian orders everyone to stay alert. He orders the others to put the paddle wheel on full power. The others load up the ballista and use this chance to strike first. Schwartz fully realizes that the Daybreak was real all along and gets excited to see women on board. He orders his men to speed up and the pirate ship chases the Daybreak. Nick wonders how they can easily catch up to them. Chin Tian explains that they had more manpower. Schwartz gets frustrated that Daybreak is faster. Chadley then orders his men to launch the chain and obtain wealth and women from the Daybreak. Chin Tian wonders what is happening. Chadley's men prepare ballistas, and Chadley orders them to fire them. Hook chains are launched from the pirate ship and they lodge on the Daybreak's rear. Schwartz laughs and orders the men to get on the chains and prepare muskets to cover. The twins start firing arrows at the pirates and take down some of them. Schwartz asks the musketeers to hurry. Chin Tian orders the others to take cover. Everyone runs toward the cabin and the pirates start firing their muskets. It's a good thing that there is a distance. The bullet's firepower can't fully penetrate the wooden wall. Chin Tian then tells the others to use the pirates' reloading time as their chance to fight back. Kata and Nick will fend off the ones on chains. The twins, Ragna and Aruba, will look for a higher place to kill the musketeers. However, Chin Tian notices that there is only a two-second gap between the shots. He then realizes that the pirates are using a rotation system. The others are getting worried about the pirates on the chain. Chin Tian is getting anxious since they are outnumbered and under heavy fire. Kata offers to buy them some time, but Chin Tian tells them to wait for his signal. Everyone got worried that Chin Tian was going alone outside. They don't want Chin Tian to be hurt. Just then, Chin Tian uses his ring, and the others think that Chin Tian is using his wizard power. A shield appears and blocks the incoming bullets. Chin Tian is lucky that it works. He then tells the others to stay behind him and wait for his orders to counterattack. Kata, Nick, and the others start their counterattack. Kata and Nick are truly exceptional when it comes to close quarter combat. The twins are also good at marksmanship. The pirates then start panicking after seeing their comrades die. Chin Tian knows that the daybreak is at a disadvantage, but they must use this chance to injure or kill as many as they can. Chin Tian orders the others to hit the pirates hard. Chadley can't believe that they are not scared of bullets and assumes that they are indeed ghosts. Schwartz is also in disbelief and decides to use the big guns. The pirates then prepare their cannons. Chin Tian tells the others to hide behind him. They fire a cannonball, and Chin Tian hopes that the shield will work. The cannonball bounced off of the shield, but the impact was enough to make Chin Tian's hand numb. He orders the others to counterattack, and ballista arrows start flying toward the pirates and even the cannoneers. Just when Chin Tian is praising the shield's effectiveness, the ring notices that it is now low on battery. He then hands over the ring to Aruba, who is scared to use it. Chin Tian tells him to wait there. Chin Tian barges into the animal cabin and picks up some chickens. He goes to the experiment lab and puts the chickens in a weird position on the wooden floor. She learned this during childhood, a Taoist method to make the chickens immobile. When he got to college, he learned that these animals' tonic immobility is a survival mechanism when they are in danger. He then places a board on top of the chicken's head, and Chin Tian now has a stable desk in the moving ship. Next, make a miracle. Chin Tian calms himself down. He then prepares the sodium carbonate solution. He added concentrated nitric acid next. Salt paper is added to cool down the solution. Next is concentrated sulfuric acid and the hardest part is the glycerin acid. The chin must be steady and let the glycerin acid drip every 10 seconds. The solution starts dropping like the pirates outside are dropping into the ocean. Nick checks on Aruba who is barely holding out when using the ring's shield. Pakuma tells them to hang because he knows Chin Tian has a solution. Speaking of the devil, Chin Tian finishes his solution. Nitroglycerin, the most explosive liquid in history. Chin Tian must be careful with the next step or the daybreak will blow into pieces. Chin Tian then slowly pours the solution into distilled water. The excess oil separates from the nitroglycerin. He did learn this process from the book he purchased recently, but it was a dangerous experiment. He needs to properly store it. Outside, Aruba is already getting tired of using the shield. The pirates can see that they are getting tired. Schwartz wants to destroy the ship, but Chadley reminds him about the women. Just then, Chadley notices something. Chin Tian runs back to the deck and commends the others for holding up. He takes back the ring from Aruba and activates his superpowers. He lands on the chain and runs on it while carrying a chicken with a bamboo container tied to it. Chadley is surprised to witness Chin Tian's inhuman movements and orders the musketeers to kill him. Schwartz tells Chadley to leave it to him and confronts Chin Tian on the chain. 
Chin Tian punches the talkative Schwartz in the face and the pirate falls into the ocean. Chin Tian warns the pirates to watch out since their master is coming. The pirates wonder what Chin Tian will do. He found what he was looking for and ran past the pirates with his super speed. The pirates kept shooting him but Chin Tian got his shield up. He enters a door and runs down the stairs. He reaches the keel which will sing the ship once blown. Chin Tian brings out his newly concocted solution and throws it. Nick and the others then notice the pirate ship explode. She gets worried about Chin Tian but Kata sees him. While shielded, Chin Tian falls into the ocean. Seeing Chin Tian splash into the water, Nick grabs a rope and hastily jumps into the ocean. The others can see the pirates panicking as they are being sucked into a whirlpool. They even betrayed each other for the sake of survival. Ragna gets worried that Chin Tian and Nick will also get swept into it. Pokuma asks Jessica to stop the ship while Ragna jumps off the daybreak to save Chin Tian and Nick. Jessica is having a hard time turning the ship and Ellen comes to help her. Nick reaches out for Chin Tian's hand and grabs him, the rope tightened as the whirlpool tried to suck the two away. Chin Tian orders Nick to let go or both of them will die. However, Nick won't let go. Chin Tian knows that Nick won't hold for too long. Nick suddenly releases the rope and Chin Tian quickly pulls her into the shield. The two get sucked into the whirlpool as Chin Tian hugs Nick tightly. Soon after, Chin Tian wakes up to see the chicken who assisted him in blowing up the ship. He then sits up and checks on Nick. He then discovers himself in an icy environment. Chin Tian keeps slapping Nick until she wakes up. However, she got hurt after straining her arms during the incident. She wonders where they are right now, but Chin Tian doesn't have an idea. Just then, the ring beeps, and it should be Ellen calling. Ellen and Jessica appear on the screen and are glad that Chin Tian and Nick are well. The screen starts buzzing and Chin Tian discovers that the ring is low on battery. The shield disappears and they all fall into the cold water. Chin Tian saves the injured Nick. He also notices that the chicken got frozen. He grabs the chicken and runs off somewhere while dragging Nick. He needs to take action soon, or the cold environment will chill them. This region must be the polar environment and the middle must be the mountainous forest. However, Chin Tian doesn't know when they can reach it, especially with Nick who is injured. Nick suddenly falls flat to the ground and Chin Tian carries her off somewhere. He tells her not to fall asleep and he starts digging for a snow cave. After some time, he orders Nick to get in. They take a quick breather, then start digging again. Nick finds it interesting that it is warm inside even though they are on ice. She also wonders what the pit is for in the middle. Chin Tian explains that it conducts the sinking cold air. The carbon dioxide they breathe out then makes the air around them warm. Nick confesses that she doesn't understand, but she is feeling hot now and starts stripping off her clothes. Chin Tian realizes that Nick has hypothermia and tells her not to move. Undressing means that they are freezing to death. Experts say that the blood vessels in the limbs will shrink to maintain blood flow during the cold. Chin Tian tries to hold the struggling Nick who wants to strip off her clothes. Luckily, Chin Tian brought a lighter, and it still works despite falling into the water. Chin Tian undresses and warms up Nick with the lighter's flame and his body heat. Suddenly Nick starts moving in her sleep and hugs Chin Tian. Chin Tian gets flustered and swears to the reader that he didn't take off his clothes for perverted moments. He explains that wet clothes will only freeze and bring down their temperature. It is better to take them off. Chin Tian needs to persevere in this do-or-die situation. However, something else is also reacting to this situation. Nick wakes up while panting. Chin Tian tries to explain something but Nick shuts him up with a kiss. Chin Tian didn't even put up resistance against Nick's advances. After the long kiss, Chin Tian tries to keep his sanity. He holds Nick tighter and Nick soundly falls asleep. Chin Tian now needs to plan how to get out of the situation. The afternoon comes and Nick wakes up. She sees Chin Tian soundly sleeping while topless. Nick lets out a loud scream and Nick suddenly acts embarrassed while backing off. Despite that, the blushing Nick returns to Chin Tian's chest. Chin Tian watches Nick enjoy his warmth. He recalls their first meeting and becoming her husband. He only agreed before to protect her. He now feels bad that he keeps dodging the topic and keeps forgetting it. Jessica and Ellen are already causing him trouble. A third wife is too much but he can't give up on Nick. Nick quickly saved Chin Tian, who was in trouble, and Chin Tian feels lucky to have her on his adventures. Night falls and Chin Tian tries to explain again. Nick knows that Chin Tian did it to keep her warm. She claims she won't read into it. She knows that she is nothing compared to Jessica and Ellen. Chin Tian hugs her tighter and claims that he did it for their survival. The tight warm embrace just made Nick happier. Nick enjoyed the warmth more until she noticed something poking her. Chin Tian tries to calm down what needs to be calmed down and apologizes. The morning comes and Nick still wants some hugs. However, Chin Tian won't fall for her seduction in the meantime. Their clothes became dry after the ice froze. They start moving around their bodies to promote blood circulation and generate heat. Just then, someone's stomach rumbles. Chin Tian brings out the frozen terrorist assistant. He cuts off the chicken's cold body. The parasites should have frozen to death too. They can eat chicken meat like sashimi. Nick wonders if they will eat the offals, but Chin Tian claims there might still be a risk of parasite infection. 
they can use them as bait instead later on. Nick gets excited over the thought of catching wild animals. In this kind of environment, there should be animals native to the region. Among them, Chin Tian wants to try hunting a polar bear. Polar bears have a keener sense of smell compared to dogs, and they can be attracted by offal. However, they have a home advantage when it comes to fighting. Nick then wonders why Chin Tian is still not eating. Our modern protagonist finds it hard to eat chicken meat raw. He takes a bite, chews on the meat and spits it out. Nick reminds him that they should survive together. Chin Tian also knew that he tried to take a bite again. He retches, but Nick grabs a handful of snow and blocks Chin Tian's mouth with it. She exclaims that this is for their survival. With a determined look, Chin Tian swallows the raw meat. Will Chin Tian be able to survive the new harsh environment with Nick? Please read the pinned comment about the next part.